the low glucose, actually in an indirect way, we'll talk about that later in the semester, and it causes these alpha cells to release a completely different hormone into the bloodstream called glucagon. Glucagon goes out to different effector cells, and what does it tell those cells to do? It tells those cells, okay, glucose is low out here in circulation, release some of your glucose from the cells, put it into the circulation to get it up back to normal. And why does the body really want to keep glucose in that normal range? It's because your brain, your central nervous system tissue needs glucose every minute and the non-starving brain. During starvation, it can use another substrate as well. Red blood cells need glucose. So there are a number of glucose dependent tissues in the body and the body wants to keep glucose not too high, not too low, but in this case, you don't want it too low because there are some tissues that are absolutely dependent on glucose and you get rapid dysfunction if they don't have it. So, for example, your hepatocytes, these are specific cells in your liver. In the presence of glucagon, they will simulate glycogenolysis. That's breaking down glycogen. Those are chains of glucose molecules that are stored in skeletal muscle and the liver, but only in the liver can you break down that glucose and then release it into the bloodstream. Skeletal muscle can break down glucose to something called glucose 6-phosphate, but glucose 6-phosphate can't leave through the membrane to go into the bloodstream. It stays in the muscle where it's needed for contractions. And hepatocytes will also stimulate a excuse me, glucagon will also stimulate hepatocytes for something called gluconeogenesis. This is building new glucose molecules from non-carbohydrate substrates such as lactate, glycerol, many of the amino acids. You can make, genesis means formation or creation, neo means new, gluco means sweet or sugar, but in this case it's glucose, so it's creation of new glucose molecules from non-carbohydrate precursors. And so the liver is releasing glucose back into the bloodstream. Your glucose is going to rise closer to normal. Those sensors in your pancreatic alpha cells sense that, they turn off. Sensor, effector, negative feedback. What we see here is glucose is bi-directionally regulated. If it's too high, we have a way of getting it back down to normal. If it's too low, we have a way of get, getting it back up to normal. Almost all, and probably all, homeostatically controlled factors are bi-directionally controlled. If you don't want too much, get it back to normal. If you don't want too little, get it, put it back up to normal, okay? So this is bi-directional control. That's what it means. And so here you notice there's a reflex arc up here. There's hello. So it's working for you now? Yeah, yeah, it's not flashing. Everything seems to be running okay, fine. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry Appreciate to it you. very much. There's a separate reflex arc with different players down here. This is the afferent limb. This is the efferent limb down here. The afferent's the sensing limb, information coming in. Efferent limb is the affecting, effecting, taking care of the job. Any questions? Yes? Did you say that? The main place we break down glucose is in the liver and then it can release? Well, the main place we break down glycogen, so it can be released as glucose into the bloodstream, is the liver. So someone with liver failure, do they have a lot of problems with this? With liver failure, you have a lot of problems with a lot of things. <laughs> a whole lot of things. <laughs> and you know, pancreatic failure, liver failure, and that can be one of them. That can be one of them. Some people have specific failures of the liver, some genetic diseases, where you store this glycogen, but you can't break it down. And that, in and of itself, starts causing a different type of liver failure. You know, you want to make those glycogen stores, and then when glucose is low, break them down so it can release. Skeletal muscle has a lot of glycogen, but it doesn't have the enzyme for the very last step to taking off a phosphate group See, the liver has something called glucose 6-phosphatase, and it can take glucose 6-phosphate and convert it to pure glucose, and that can go out of a membrane. 
glucose 6-phosphate can, can, can't, excuse me. And so skeletal muscle can break it to glucose 6-phosphate, which it can use for energy then to supply muscle contractions, but it can't go to glucose itself to leave the cell. Okay, so uh, I do want you to read on page nine about positive feedback. Here I've been talking about negative feedback. Your body only utilizes positive feedback regulation in a couple of ways, and because it's dangerous, it's playing with fire. It's playing with fire. It's like when there is a gas well that is blown up and, and fire is just shooting out of the well. What's one way they knock those things out? They put a huge bomb by it and they explode it and they, they blow out the flame. Well, and explosions are dangerous, right? Well, positive feedback can be potentially dangerous. So your body only uses that in a couple of places, in, in, you know, to help affect things. So page eight, I want you to read about that. Feed forward regulation. Ah, oh, your body does this all the time. And this is simply, for example, before that glucose after your breakfast even enters the bloodstream, you're going to start releasing some, a small amount of some molecules that will stimulate the release of insulin. So it prepares the body for the glucose to come. And for example, there are gut hormones that sense the presence of carbohydrate in the gut, even before it's digested and absorbed it, and it says, okay, let's release a little insulin now because glucose is on its way. So do read about feed forward regulation. They're very short, but uh, they're very helpful. Okay, some important smaller things uh, about, I could just call them homeostatic booms because you kind of have to think about them a little bit, but think about this. You don't want all of your proteins turned on all the time. You want them turned on at the right time. So how does the body regulate whether proteins are turned on or turned off? Well, it's really by microenvironment. And I put just one example there, and I think maybe in your notes I put MPO as well. But pepsin. Pepsin is a proteolytic enzyme. It will just, it will go in and start hydrolyzing, breaking down a number of different proteins. So, you know, the cells in the lining of your stomach, the chief cells, you don't want pepsin in those cells where it's being created, where it's being synthesized, to just destroy that cell. So it's actually released in an inactive form called pepsinogen, and once it goes into your the, the lumen of your stomach, due to the environment, the acidic environment, it activates that pepsinogen to pepsin. And then it can start hydrolyzing amino acids, and, well, peptides really, off of proteins that you've eaten. So there's a microenvironment. The environment inside the cell is different than the environment inside the lumen of your stomach. So you don't want that protein turned on all the time. And that's the case with proteins throughout your body. You want it turned on right place, right time. You don't want your muscles contracting all the time. And calcium is a very important signal to initiate skeletal muscle contraction. So those proteins are just kind of waiting until calcium gets to a certain level in the cell, and then that leads to a contraction. So I don't want you to think that, OK, homeostasis makes all the proteins turned on all the time. No, just at the right times. You have these little changes in microenvironment that will turn things on and turn things off. Set points. Now, our body well, likes to keep glucose between 70 and 100 milligrams of glucose in every deciliter of extracellular fluid or plasma. Either. But it doesn't always keep it in that set point range. Sometimes it's better for the body if it's a little higher. Sometimes it's better for the body if it's a little bit lower. Same thing with your body temperature. You know, you're cruising here around 98 degrees.
degrees Fahrenheit, maybe a little bit more. I tend to cruise about a degree less than everybody. I'm kind of a cool guy. Anyway, uh, I'm a 97.8. That's where I hang out most of the time. But during times of infection, in our in your ancestors, going back great, 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 great grandparents, before they had medical care, that increase in temperature actually sets off a series of processes that helped protect them a little bit from that infection. It helped the body try to gain an upper hand, hopefully. So sometimes it is helpful to change these set points. Uh, so do read uh, Resetting Set Points, page, pages eight and nine. Uh, and you'll see a lot of different things, like the baroreceptors that are the short-term regulators of your blood pressure. They're, these things, if your blood pressure happens to be abnormally elevated for about 72 hours, they start resetting to that high blood pressure. And that's a, not a good thing. Uh, I had a friend a number of years ago. He was living here in Old Lincoln. I was living in New Orleans. And he called me up. Uh, it, it was, I don't know, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. And, and you know, once I realized who it was, it's like, oh man, something's not right. He said, Crouch, I'm in the hospital, and I'm either dying or going crazy, and I'm not sure which one's preferable. <laughs> Whoa, what's going on, man? Well, he's a musician, and he was playing guitar, blowing the flowing harp when he was uh, playing music at a place <coughs> here in town, and he inhaled for a note, he inhaled a metal reed broke off his harmonica and it went to his lungs and he, you know, you go, you put something that's coated with bacteria in your lungs, clinicians get really, really excited about it because your lungs will happily, they are a barrier tissue that they'll do anything to wipe out invading pathogens. And what are they doing? They're wiping out innocent bystander areas of the lung. It can cause pulmonary inflammation that can lead to a progression of problems that can cause death. And he, to prevent that from happening, he was put on high dose prednisone. We're going to talk about that later, because three years ago I had to be put on it. I'm wearing hearing aids. Uh, October 3rd, four years ago, uh, I woke up, my ears are stuffy, I'm starting to get dizzy, and by two weeks later I've lost 80% of my hearing on this side, 60% on this side. I had an inflammatory reaction in one of my inner ears. He had an, a powerful inflammatory reaction happening inside his lungs, so the clinicians had to stop it. They gave him a very powerful, uh, very powerful uh, glucocorticoid that will raise your blood pressure. It's doing what it's supposed to, being very anti-inflammatory, saving his life, but I'll show you later how you get this cross reactivity with receptors and his blood pressure kept going higher and higher and higher and they were like well we'll deal with that later we'll deal with that later my blood pressure was cranking uh, 155 over 105 that was as low as it was getting and if your blood pressure stays elevated for more than 72 hours you start resetting your barrel receptors to that high in that, those cases, those are iatrogenic or physician-caused phenomena, but you know they were trying to preserve my hearing, they were trying, trying to preserve his life, so yeah, your blood pressure's gonna go up. Hopefully when we take you off the medication, it comes down, his did. He was being, he had to be treated for hypertension for close to eight years before he had been controlled long enough that now he's no longer hypertensive, but he had a strong family background, he had a genetic background for hypertension. My blood pressure, Thank goodness came back down. So these set points, they can be dynamic rather than set in stone. Many disease processes, signs and symptoms, or I should say are due to homeostatic dysregulation. When homeostasis breaks down, a patient may feel something and may offer a complaint, or you may be able to measure something. And remember, and I know this is told to you guys all the time you probably heard it forever. Symptoms are what the patient reports to you. Signs are what you will measure. So patients will come in and offer you symptoms and you're going to take their blood pressure, listen to their heart, listen to their lungs. You're looking for signs, okay? 
So many disease processes uh, and signs and symptoms are due to homeostatic dysregulation. So might as well make this uh, not just talk about homeostasis, but for example, the disease of type 1 diabetes mellitus. Type 1 diabetes mellitus. It used to be called juvenile onset diabetes because generally, if it's going to happen, it usually happens before somebody turns 20 years of age. It doesn't mean you won't find an older person with type 1, but uh, it tends to come on earlier in life. It used to be thought that it could happen within uh, weeks to months. It, and what's happening during type 1 diabetes is your body's, is the body's immune system is starting to recognize those insulin releasing beta cells, beta pancreatic cells, as a foreign invader, a foreign tissue. And it's going in and it's picking them off. Your own body's immune system is going in and knocking those things out. It turns out now that that is happening two, three, four, five years. We are born with so many more pancreatic beta cells than what you need at any given second. We, are, we have what's called a physiologic reserve. I'll show you a slide on that. But we have a physiologic reserve of pancreatic beta cells when we're born. So somebody can be losing pancreatic beta cells because of this immune-mediated destruction for a long period of time, and there are no clinical signs or symptoms, they're fine, they're fine. And then once you've lost your last reserve pancreatic beta cell and then you're getting down toward the end, symptoms and signs appear very, very rapidly. The person starts to urinate a lot, they're starting to eat a lot, they're losing weight, they're bruising very easily. Because once you've lost your physiologic reserve, then you don't have enough insulin. And what's going to happen if if somebody isn't making, you know, a, a, an, undi an undiagnosed, untreated diabetic, uh, a type one diabetic, they have zero insulin in their circulation. What's going to happen to plasma glucose? It's going to go up and up and up and up, isn't it? Because insulin is the signal to all those effector cells, glucose is out here. Take it out of the bloodstream. So these folks have huge amounts of glucose, which is an energy molecule in circulation, but their body doesn't recognize it because insulin's not there to tell. So it gets so high that glucose is released in the urine. Normally, glucose is reclaimed by the kidney. Kidney will filter all sorts of things and get rid of waste products and foreign products, but reclaim good things like glucose, amino acids, water soluble vitamins, sodium, whatever. Puts it back into the bloodstream. But if and it has a huge capacity to do that, but if glucose gets so high, glucose starts going out in the urine, it pulls water with it, that's urinating calories. So somebody starts losing weight. They're urinating a lot because <coughs> the glucose molecule goes out. About three water molecules cling to it and go out with it. So they're constantly eating, constantly drinking, and that high glucose makes them very fragile and poor healers, so they bruise readily and the bruises don't go away. So that's really type 1 diabetes. Those pancreatic beta cells cannot produce insulin. Yeah. Pancreatic beta cells cannot produce insulin. That leads to this inappropriate elevated plasma glucose. Now, contrast that with type 2 diabetes. They have pancreatic beta cells. Now, now there are some type 2 diabetics that if they've had poorly controlled type 2 diabetes for years and years and years and years, they can start losing beta cells, but the vast majority of type 2 diabetics, so let's say in those first few years of diabetes, they're producing insulin. The problem is these effector cells, they've lost some of their sensitivity to insulin. So normally when a little insulin binds those cells, it causes glucose to be taken up and many, many other things to happen, which we won't go over now. But 
those tissue, those effector cell tissues become insulin resistant. So insulin resistance or tissue resistance is what you see in, excuse me, in type one, in type two, excuse me, uh, diabetes, that the effector cells become insensitive or resistant to insulin. So in both cases, you have inappropriate hyperglycemia. In type one diabetes, diabetics, there's no insulin or not enough insulin to cause cells to take up glucose. And in type two, you have insulin, but the insulin no longer is stimulating the cell normally. And this is going to be a big part of your professional life right here because of that explosion of type two diabetes. For many of you, this will be a big part of your life. Any questions on that? Okay. So our body, like I didn't give you this slide, you'll get it later. I just kind of want you to sit back and look at this. Your body, this green, this is where your body wants to keep your plasma glucose, between 70 and 100. So anything below that's hypo, hypoglycemia, and anything above that is hyperglycemia. And when you get below 70 going toward 50, people start getting sweaty, shaky, irritable, a lot of different things, very often nervous, get a headache. Uh, and if that plasma glucose, and different organizations have different cutoff points on where is frank hypoglycemia and so forth. So yeah, different medical groups. Oh, it's 55, and no, someone's 50. Bottom line is, when it gets much lower, remember your brain and some tissues in the body need a constant second by second, minute by minute uptake of glucose. They're, they don't need insulin to take up glucose. They just need glucose out there. If it gets below this, they're not going to be able to bring in enough glucose every minute. You get neural dysfunction, loss of consciousness, can lead to seizure, coma, and death. Within this is this is an emergency. This will happen in a matter of minutes. Yes. So we've actually had a patient before that they are constantly high and very normal runs in like the 300s. And so they actually had were unconscious, shaky, dizzy, all that. If they were anything below like 120, so have they basically just reset their normal at that point? Boy, you know, yeah, anytime they got below 120. Yeah, 120. You know, I, I, I've heard I've heard this so many different times. I don't, I don't know, it gets back to what is happening as far as, you know, these things right here, it's how much is going into the central nervous system. I don't think they're probably neurologically involved, but other things, probably it is below a new set point for, not all tissues have the same set point, okay? So this, you see the same thing with blood pressure. People that have been high for a long time and then you get very aggressive and you try to keep them 130, 120, they stand up and pass out, stand up and pass out. So that doesn't surprise me. Now one thing I should mention, and yeah, I saw your hand right there. This is a, one of the big problems. We'll talk about hyperglycemia. Some patients who are hyperglycemic and on a lot of different medications to drive it, drive it down, they are, much more susceptible to go on to become hypoglycemic because of all the meds they're on and then you add something else on it like an infection or a stress of going to see the doctor you add one more trigger on there and because of all those medications they actually become hypoglycemic within minutes yeah could someone suffer brain damage if they were in that low range of two yes oh absolutely absolutely and it happens within minutes uh, because if they're down for too long and then you resuscitate them, there can be residual damage. Yeah, because it needs that. Once the brain becomes acidotic, it, some bad things happen. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of times that one can resuscitate somebody and you don't always get all of them back. Hyperglycemia tends to be a much slower, more insidious, progressive problem that occurs over decades. There is something called hyperglycemic hyperosmotic uh, crisis or syndrome that you're going to hear about 
clinical medicine that there's so much glucose in the bloodstream. Glucose molecules attract water molecules. Glucose has a lot of OH groups, and OH groups attract water, and that can lead to an emergency problem. But normally, hyperglycemia is not causing any emergency type symptoms that would send somebody to the doctor. They don't feel high glucose, but over time, elevated glucose, whoops, elevated glucose has a very old I shouldn't say corrosive, but a very damaging impact on blood vessels and tissues. And the severity of the damage is uh, really closely related to the duration of the hyperglycemia and the degree of the hyperglycemia. We'll talk about this later on in the semester. And so hypoglycemia, this can come on rapidly, leading to problems that you must address very, very quickly. Hyperglycemia, this comes on slowly. And normally, it's not a, a 10 minute, 20 minute emergency situation. You, know, you, you want to treat that patient, of course, but this is an emergent situation. You may get into frank hypoglycemia. Okay, so now sometimes these homeostatic mechanisms just get maxed out. They're trying to regulate something as best as it can 